had fireflies in our front yard every night in the summer and, uh, and other places I've lived too. We moved here in 1991 when my kids were two and six and we have never had fireflies in our yard and I've never known anybody who knew about them around here much except people you know who are older a couple of years ago probably 10 years ago now um dick benoit and i were leading a hayride out on the prairie in the evening and as we were coming back about dusk we came past the prairie platform and alongside the trees and they were just alive with fireflies and so we stopped the wagon and and show, showed the kids that were there and they, look, look, there's fireflies. They didn't have a single clue even what they were looking at. They had never seen fireflies. And I thought, well, there is just something wrong with this picture. Anyhow, so there are about 170 species of fireflies in, the, in North America and maybe over 2000 worldwide. And our speaker tonight, Ben Pfeiffer has made it his passion, his goal, his life's work to learn about fireflies. And he's trying to catalog all the fireflies in Texas and maybe in America, in the Southwest. He has set up an organization called Firefly Conservation and Research. And you can access it on the website at firefly.org. And you can learn a lot from what he has published on his website. He is going to speak to us tonight about fireflies and it's too bad he can't be here but he would like to come in the spring so I would really like it if everybody would be on their best behavior and maybe he will still want to come see us in the spring when the fireflies are out. So thank you very much and uh, take it away Ben. Awesome. Thank you, Diane, for uh, the introduction. I really do appreciate it. I'm really thrilled to, to speak to you all tonight. Um, I just added a few unique things to the presentation that pertains to your area specifically. So uh, we'll go through that in detail. Uh, but like Diane said, um, I study fireflies here in Texas. Um, I've been studying fireflies here for around 10 years. And um, kind of the crux of what I'm trying to do is trying to de dis determine what the biodiversity of firefly species are here in Texas. I had a really big burning question and I really wanted to know what was here species wise. Um, and to my amazement, um, there hadn't been a whole lot of work done here. We've had some entomologists that kind of come through um, and name a few species here, but until I kind of started working in it, uh, there hadn't been any really native Texans, so to say, kind of spending time. So I kind of dove into this. Uh, this is not my job. This is kind of more of uh, an academic pursuit. And um, I really enjoy getting out in habitats, studying them um, and studying the firefly specifically. Um, they are kind of a hard insect to study. So you have to study not only the morphology of the insect, the structure, coloration, but you also have to understand, also have to study the flash pattern. Uh, so that can make it a little tricky and you just gotta to train your eyes and get real familiar with it. So tonight I'm going to give a presentation. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, what is a firefly, uh, what makes up a firefly, um, what kind of habitat fireflies prefer, how they mate. Um, we're gonna talk a bit about Texas species as well. Uh, we're also gonna talk about some of the threats that fireflies face. So this can be anything from pollution to habitat loss. Uh, so we'll go over that in detail. And then I'll have some recommendations as well that you can make in terms of your own yard if you wanna encourage fireflies, um, because there are actually th some things that you can do in order to encourage them. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started and share my screen. Uh, just one final thing, um, I'm going to be, uh, we'll we're going to have a question and answer section uh, halfway through the presentation. So if you've got any questions that you'd like to do, uh, you can save them until we get to about the middle point of the presentation, and then you can post them in the chat. And I'll spend about five, 10 minutes answering some of those. Um, so no questions are off limits. Feel free, even if it's, thinks, you think it sounds dumb, feel free to, to ask it. Uh, happy to elaborate on it. Um, and I look forward to, to seeing uh, what kind of questions that y'all might have. So let me go ahead and get started. All right, so um, what are fireflies? Uh, that's a question um, some people just don't know. They actually, they're beetles. Uh, they're not flies um, or anything like that. They're, they're beetles and they're in the order Cleoptera, which is a very diverse group. 
um, around the world. There's over 400,000 species um, of beetles in the order Cleoptera, so it's very diverse. Um, lightning bugs go by a lot of names. Um, in Texas, we refer to them as lightning bugs, fireflies, that glowy thing over there. Um, but whatever you call them, at the end of the day, they're beetles. Um, and they all belong to the family Lampyridae. So fireflies in the family Lampyridae all share several kind of features. Um, they bioluminesce as adults and as juveniles. Um, they all have relatively soft elongated bodies. Sometimes we call these squishy beetles uh, because uh, you can relatively squish them pretty easily. They have a flattened shield that kind of covers the back of their head, um, this right here. Um, that's what is called the pronotum. Um, so if I'm speaking during the presentation and I refer to the pronotum, um, it's going to be this uh, flattened head shield right here. Um, the head shield or pronotum is usually large and kind of shield-like and it has some colorful markings on it. Um, you might notice from the photos off to the right, you see that uh, the firefly at the top has kind of a yellow orangish color and then kind of almost an orange red spot in the middle. Uh, the firefly in the lower right hand corner um, has a, a shield that is similar, but it's got a large black stripe or spot kind of located there. Um, and so this can vary quite a bit between species. Sometimes it's a blob or a smudge. Sometimes it's a triangle, um, a round spot. Sometimes it lacks it completely. Most species of fireflies are around five to 20 millimeters long. Um, to kind of put that in perspective, a uh, 20 millimeter long firefly is about an inch. Um, and they can get as big as sometimes 25 millimeters on kind of the high end. And so that's a relatively very large firefly. Um, and in places like in South America, they can get twice, three times as big as that. This is just a, um, a brief uh, image that I put together, um, just showing kind of just a brief anatomy, just so you're familiar. Um, I mentioned before uh, the pronotum um, and that sometimes there's a spot on there and that's what we would call like a pronotal spot. Uh, this is helpful for firefly scientists because oftentimes we look at this to determine sometimes whether it's a unique species or not or whether it differs from another one. So it's just one of the clues that we use. Um, they have a, a really hard plate that's in between uh, the pronotum and uh, the elytra. Uh, it's called the scutellum. Um, and sometimes this is colored, uh, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it'll be black like in this example and other times it'll be the same color as uh, you know, other parts like yellow. Um, they have uh, two wing covers. These are called elytra. Um, and occasionally, and some fireflies, they'll have what's called a elytral margin. These are things that we look at when we study fireflies, because um, some species will have a margin, but it will be the, all the same color as the rest of the elytra. Um, so this is helpful for us, uh, because if we find a firefly that, let's say, has all black wing covers or elytra, um, this might be, indicate maybe a potentially new species or it might be species specific. Um, and finally, uh, fireflies have antennas uh, like other insects um, and there's, they have about 11 segments here. So this image right here shows the difference between a female firefly and a male firefly. Um, off the bat, you can probably tell the difference between the two just immediately. Um, and the clue is obviously that um, the female seems to lack a light organ. And, and in this example, you can see uh, the male off to the right has what are two light organs. Uh, these are sometimes called turgets. Um, and then off to the left, the female has one light organ. Uh, why is that? Um, well, females don't have to invest as much energy into light production. They would rather do that in order for egg production because um, they're laying eggs. So they don't need as bright of a lantern, so to say. Um, so if you're ever out in the field and you catch a firefly, be sure to turn it over and look at it. If you find that it's got one spot like that, um, in this case with this uh, Photina species, um, you want to make sure to leave it in the habitat uh, because kind of females are kind of the future um, and they're the ones that are going to like sire offspring and lay eggs. So those are ones that we don't want to disturb. Uh, just a little bit about firefly diversity um, in Texas in general. Um, there's around 2,000 species worldwide. Um, we've got about 180 species in the United States. There's new species kind of being named um, almost every year on a yearly basis. Um, and there's scientists kind of working to, to do that. It's a small group of people that work on firefly uh, taxonomy, but um, they're a rather devoted group. And so new species are coming out every so often. 
Um, in Texas, we've got about 45 species or so, um, and these include uh, diurnal daytime flying species to nighttime flying. Um, to give you some uh, comparison, uh, Florida and Georgia have around 50 plus species. So Texas ranks right up there with some of the highest diversity of firefly species in the United States. So that makes us really lucky to live in Texas because we have such diversity of fireflies. Um, a little on the basics of firefly life cycle. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that fireflies actually spend most of their life in the larval state. Um, and then as an adult, they only really live for about three to four weeks, uh, sometimes shorter than that. Um, and then as an egg, they spend three weeks and then when they pupate, about three weeks. So the larval state of a firefly is really um, the, the stage that they're in the most. Um, and it's one of the ones that we're most concerned with when we're talking about firefly conservation. Now off to the left um, in the lower right hand corner is a picture of a firefly larva. Kind of looks like this prehistoric, um, you know, uh, Jurassic thing. Um, and they're pretty predaceous. Um, but that's kind of what they look like when they crawl on the ground or you find them in the mud. Um, up to the left is an example of a firefly pupa. Uh, this is pyrectomina, for example, that kind of pupates between pieces of bark. Um, and then over to the far right is an image of a firefly larva that just hatched from the egg. Now you might look and you might notice that the tail end, what looks like the tail, is got a lighter region and that is a firefly that is glowing after just hatching from an egg. Um, and this goes back to some of the shared characteristics that I talked about earlier in terms of being able to bioluminesce as larva um, and then as also as an adult. So flash patterns, this is the, the kind of thing that we all like to see. It's one of the most enjoyable parts about fireflies. Um, and to most people, the flash of a firefly kind of looks the same as another. Um, but in reality, each firefly species has its own fairly distinct flash pattern uh, or species specific flash pattern. Um, and these flash patterns can vary in quite of, uh, a few ways. So temperature can influence a flash pattern in terms of uh, the interval of time between flashes. So if a firefly flashes every four seconds um, in let's say 80 degree weather, if it gets hotter, um, and to like 90 degrees Fahrenheit, um, it might flash, uh, flash faster. Uh, so um, temperature can play a big role. If you're on a cold evening, sometimes in the fall, this is really happens a lot, you'll see flash patterns that slow down a little bit. So we have to be aware of that. Uh, color can vary as well. Uh, somebody mentioned earlier about seeing uh, yellow and then green and some kind of light blue color. Um, so the color of a firefly uh, genus uh, or species sometimes can vary. In this example, uh, Photinus genus of fireflies have more of a yellowish green flash, whereas a Pyroctomina has more of an amber color flash. Now you can kind of see this in this chart over to the right where you see some kind of yellowish color and then you'll see kind of a amber color uh, flash pattern. And Pyroctomina is kind of illustrated here um, as the one in the bottom. Um, the number of flashes can vary as well. As you can see in this chart, sometimes it's uh, dot, 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 um, and then like an interval period in between. Other times um, it's, uh, you know, a single flash and then preceded by like, you know, some, some time in between as well. Uh, so that can, that can vary as well. Um, the time of night that they're active can also vary as well. They, sometimes you'll see uh, Photinus genus of fireflies occur earlier in the evening, like right at dusk, whereas other genuses or species will occur later in the evening. And finally, one thing you might not have noticed, but in the image of your off to your right, you see fireflies flying at varying levels. So you have some that are kind of flashing within this kind of grass habitat, and then you have some that are flashing high in the trees. So that's also a clue too, in terms of it's a species specific uh, flashing area. Some like it high and some like it low. Um, some like it right in between in open areas. Uh, so that can make quite a difference. So how do they choose a mate? Um, generally flying males broadcast signals as they search for females. And um, you can see an example here of a flash pattern um, and uh, a male and a female copulating. 
Um, and the females look at these male flash patterns and they respond to it uh, based on a couple different factors. They're looking for certain things. Uh, when I give this presentation to the public, sometimes I'll, I'll ask, uh, what do female fireflies like and male fireflies? And sometimes we get some funny answers. Um, but uh, since I can't do that, um, I'm just going to give you the answer. But females like longer flashes or faster flash rates. So it can vary. Uh, females can be uh, very uh, choosy, essentially. Uh, there was a, a woman that wrote uh, a book kind of on this subject called Silent Sparks. Her name is Sarah Lewis. I highly recommend the book. Um, so if you're interested in reading more about uh, the, the, the firefly um, mating and stuff like that, that would be a great book to get. So how are fireflies helpful? Um, this is a question that a lot of people ask because we see them out there in the trees and they're flashing but a lot of times we don't really know exactly what they do. And that can be the case for actually a lot of insects if you think about it, like what is the purpose of this? And so fireflies generally kind of act as nature's pest control. Um, they're super predaceous. They consume nail, uh, snails, earthworms, dead insects. Um, some fireflies such as tetras even eat other insects and even their own kind. They act as a really good indicator of the health of an environment and they're medically useful. So uh, they're beneficial for food safety research, cancer research, development of new drugs. Uh, they use the compounds that fireflies use to light up, uh, luciferin and luciferase, um, in order to um, test, for example, whether a food's contaminated or whether um, a drug works on slowing down uh, tumor growth. Um, so they can be relatively uh, very valuable. So are fireflies disappearing? Um, and the, 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 the answer to this is yes, unfortunately. Um, I used to say that there wasn't enough empirical evidence. Um, there's only anecdotal evidence to kind of support this. Um, but as of today, there is some more empirical evidence that's starting to pile up to prove this. Um, there's definitely a lot of consensus between public and scientific communities um, that there's a whole lot fi fewer fireflies than there used to be. Um, for example, there's going to be a firefly on the potential U.S. endangered species list, um, a firefly that occurs in Delaware. Um, and so it, what is known, though, is definitely there's an urgent need for conservation of their habitats. Um, and specifically, of greatest concern are those that are local, unique, adapted species. So these are species of fireflies that occur just in like a, a regional area that if a disruption to their habitats occur, they get wiped out. Um, and in some ways, some of this has actually been occurring for the last hundred years. Um, there was probably more species and more fireflies than there used to be hundred years ago. But as uh, changes have happened across the landscape really dramatically, um, a lot of things get lost. So why are they disappearing? Pollution and loss of repairing corridors is a big one. Um, this is a uh, big issue, uh, especially since fireflies are located near uh, rivers and streams and creeks. Um, a riparian corridor, for those that don't know, is basically the interface between the water and the land. Um, it's the narrow strip of, of land that occurs right here. Um, I put this image in the presentation because it's a really good illustration of, of two problems going on here. Uh, one is pollution, as you can see this a uh, kid has pulled a uh, shopping cart out of a spring-fed creek. Um, this creek is actually uh, San Felipe Creek located in Del Rio. It's kind of one of the most polluted spring-fed uh, creeks in, the, in Texas. There is active efforts to clean it up, um, but it, it's in need of some love. Um, so that's that issue in terms of pollution. We're all familiar with what that does. Um, the other one is loss of repairing corridors. And so if you're looking at this image, you might see some um, vegetation in the background of the image. And uh, what this is, is, is a plant called Cariso cane. Um, it's an invasive species of river cane that's from somewhere over in um, Asia or Africa, something like that, that is kind of spread across river systems. And really what, is, what it's doing here is that it's creating a monoculture. 
um, it's basically replaced a lot of the plants that used to occur there naturally that were natively native adapted species of plants um, and created a monoculture. And so for a firefly, this is not great mating habitat. Um, if a male's trying to flash and a female's on the ground here, they really have a hard time seeing each other. So uh, this is an example of a habitat that's uh, severely degraded. And at one time, um, there was probably a lot more fireflies here than there used to be. So uh, this is a, a, a big concern. Habitat loss degradation, um, kind of mentioned that already. Uh, this is an example of a uh, subdivision that is, was being built to San Antonio. Uh, a developer came in and like cleared the land without permission from the city um, in San Antonio and got in trouble. Um, but it's kind of what they're doing now. They're kind of clear cutting. Um, and what a lot of people don't realize is that fireflies actually occur in some of these different habitats too like these cedar breaks um, that have like cedar elm and oak um, and some of, the, kind of some of these oak savannas in the way. Um, and so there's fireflies that occur outside of the riparian corridor. And there was probably species that occurred right here on this particular location, um, but they're pretty much gone at this point. So that's a big problem. Light pollution is another one. Um, the main problem with light pollution is that it interferes with um, females being able to see males. Um, and if a male is trying to flash and needs darkness to do that, and a female is kind of perched somewhere trying to look for those uh, males, um, if there's bright white light or you know a, a lot of ambient light in the area, it can be hard for males to come to sometimes see that. Um, that white LED light, for example, that kind of hurts your eyes, it kind of washes all colors of light out. So that's the big issue, um, is that it, it not only disrupts them from seeing each other, but it washes the color out so that they can't see it. Pesticide use is another one. Um, there's just a lot of, you know, subdivisions being built in Texas. Um, and what a lot of homeowners do is that, you know, they build them sometimes on, you know, relatively, you know, pristine sites or previously undeveloped sites. Homeowners come in, move in, find that there's bugs everywhere. They go to Home Depot and Lowe's and they buy things called beetle grub, uh, beetle kill and lawn grub kill. Um, and this kills basically all, kind of all species of beetles and fireflies are beetles after all. Um, so, uh, you know, pesticide use is an issue. Um, and then, you know, pest control companies specifically, uh, those that kind of spray willy nilly all over the place. Um, and so, you know, uh, there needs, to be some stuff, you know, be conscious about what's being sprayed. Um, so that's an issue. Um, of pesticides too, I'll mention um, water soluble pesticides are also a big concern. Uh, these are ones that get into uh, the river systems or into nearby drainage areas. Um, and these things can persist for a very long time. Uh, disappearing water tables is another one. Um, this, is, this is kind of more of an issue of aquifer decline. So to give you an example of this, at one point in Colorado, for example, there used to be a lot more seeps and like uh, wet little small areas that used to kind of sprout out uh, on the sides of mountains and like high elevations and stuff like that. Well, as Colorado has grown, for example, um, those particular areas, uh, the aquifers have declined and those previous wet seeps that used to support, you know, very small populations have declined. Um, and the same thing is in here in Texas. Um, at one point, you know, a lot of the, the springs and stuff that we had were used to be, you know, uh, big flowing, you know, geysers, basically. I give an example here of in the right hand corner. Uh, this is Jacobs Well in Wimberley, Texas. Um, and when the settlers first came to Texas, they used to describe this as like a kind of a gusher that was just gushing out of the ground. And that's because the pressure from the aquifer was so substantial that, you know, the water just like, you know, flooded out of it. And now it's just kind of a still pool. And so it no longer does that. So just, just an example of how water tables, um, you know, declining water tables influence other species. So how you can help, uh, there's some things that you can do if you want to help fireflies specifically in your area or advocate in other areas uh, for other places to do. Um, the, one of the first things that I'd recommend doing is assessing your soil health. Um, poor soil equals poor habitat for firefly food. So snails and worms and that kind of thing. Um, if you've got soil that other things don't want to eat, then you know fireflies can't find 
basically prey species in order to grow. So, you know, having poor soil um, can do that. You can make amendments to that soil to introduce nutrients. Um, another thing you can do is you can lightly till your soil. Um, when I've given this presentation to gardeners before, they always ask me, they're like, how much should you till your soil and how deep? Because uh, you don't want to go too deep. Um, but, you know, a light tilling it helps out, especially for compacted areas. Um, an example of, you know, tilling that works to help fireflies is in Central Park in Manhattan. Uh, believe it or not, there's fireflies in Central Park. And this is something that New Yorkers like, you know, when they go to Central Park, as fireflies. So they had to kind of figure out a way in order to keep fireflies in Central Park. And one of the ways that they did this was by fencing off some areas where they tilled the soil regularly and let kind of snails and worms kind of um, uh, congregate. And so this is just one small area um, that they don't let people walk on, for example, and uh, they're able to maintain some populations of fireflies with that. Um, the other one is you can avoid broad spectrum pesticides, especially lawn chemicals. Uh, turn off outside lights is another big one. Uh, advocate for adopting local policies to control light pollution. Um, and this means specifically contacting your city councilmen um, and city officials and city government to suggest dark sky policies. Um, there is uh, a lot of municipalities are relatively kind of ignorant of uh, dark sky issues. Um, so generally, um, I've seen issues where they've you know, advocated for really harsh uh, policies, uh, you know, to control light pollution. And, and generally, I don't think that's a good approach. If you want to approach this issue, you know, definitely makes recommend some changes. Um, but, you know, go for a, a way that works in your community. Um, you can buy land to protect species. Uh, land across Texas, uh, or at least pristine land, is disappearing um, at the fastest uh, clip that we've ever seen in um, you know, a human lifetime. Um, and so one day, uh, Texas is going to look a lot different. And an example of this is prairies, for example. Uh, there's only like 1% of native prairies left in Texas. Um, and so that's kind of the image off to the right. So you know, support organizations that do this. If you can afford to do this, do this as well. Uh, consider conservation easements on your property. Um, if you've got land, um, they can lower your taxes um, and also preserve it for future generations. Um, you can let log and leaf litter accumulate. This is kind of um, helping uh, with the soil as well. Um, a couple months ago, I was at Cibolo Nature Center in Bernie, and I went out um, right before I was to meet with the group, and I was uh, looking for fireflies, and I walked down this path, and sure enough, I saw a female flashing on the ground. And when I went to look over, she was actually perched on a log. And um, I realized after studying her for a while that she had been living in this log in this like dry creek bed uh, for quite some time, probably up to two years. And so uh, she just emerged right at the right time when I came out um, and she mated and she crawled back into the log. Um, so that's an example of, you know, some, uh, you know, actual habitat functioning and what those logs do. You can plant trees and native grasses. Uh, native grasses and forbs kind of help retain soil moisture. They do a really good job of that, slowing off, slowing off runoff. Uh, don't over, over mow your lawn as well. Um, and in this, I mean, um, if you've got wild areas that you mow every so frequently, um, don't over mow it. Um, or if you've got property, for example, that borders a river um, and um, you've got an idea that you want to make your land look like a park, um, but that's not really how nature works. Just stop cutting it um, as much and uh, let some of the native vegetation grow up and you'll be surprised what you find return. Um, you can start a pollinator um, garden. Um, you can help restore prairies, um, educate your neighbors, of course. Um, just a couple things on like native plants for, for fireflies. I included this because I had talked about this at uh, NEVSOT, um, but since y'all are kind of all in the same area, this would be great to kind of just recap on as well. Um, and, you know, at the Bayou uh, Nature Center, there y'all are already doing a lot of this, um, and, you know, native work with plants. And so, but um, these are some things that you can kind of think about though, when you actually plant a plant for fireflies now. So when, if we're trying to plant uh, natives for fireflies, I came up with this kind of way to think about it. And the way to think about it is like the priorities that we need to set. 
Um, and the top priority for planting uh, native plants for fireflies is uh, providing habitat for females. Um, and so this is critical habitat so that that provides diverse canopy height. So these are grasses on the, the lower level, uh, trees nearby, um, and then places for her to lay eggs. So what are plants that help create uh, leaf litter? And what are plants that help retain soil moisture? Um, and what are places that help females hide basically um, during the day? Um, the second priority that we would have would be provide habitat for larvae. Um, so these are plants that build soil leaf litter, places to find food in the, in the, in the soil and in the mud, uh, so snails and worms, um, and places that trap uh, moisture. And generally those that can um, weather flooding situations as well. Um, and then finally, uh, the third priority would be operational cover for flashing adults. So this would be males specifically. Um, the low them on the lower on the totem pole, but um, they need like operational cover to flash. And if you're familiar watching fireflies, you'll notice that they oftentimes will gravitate towards like kind of open areas that border like you know forests or you know other places like that. And so they're trying to get as visible as they can to to females, and they'll fly along. So we need some good operational cover. So this is places that can be dark. Um, and that also provide you know good canopy height, and so that's the third priority. Um, these are just a list of good plants for fireflies. Um, these are generally called facultative plants. Uh, these are plants that do wet and uh, do well in good in wet and non-wet habitats. Um, so they're good ones to plant um, because you don't have to provide a super dry environment or a super wet environment. Um, there's some grasses here. I mentioned some specific species um, that do well, like Big Sacton is a grass, for example, that Mexican firefly species likes. Um, it's a bunchy kind of grass that retains soil moisture. Um, so, you know, we have uh, native varieties of Sacton here in Texas, for example. Um, but any kind of good grass that occurs natively in your area um, would be a great recommendation. Um, Forbes, obviously, as well. Um, asters do pretty good just because they spread and they're able to just retain um, soil and moisture well, but a lot of other plants serve the same purpose. So for example, frog fruit does that um, and uh, frostweed can also have that kind of a benefit too, especially in a river environment. Um, vines can also help as well. Um, and then trees, of course, uh, there are uh, a lot of different trees that work real well in wet and non-wet locations. And so you can see some examples here, uh, sycamore, for example, pecan, little walnut, cottonwood. These are all ones that usually you find in a riparian area. So firefly habitat. Um, fireflies are habitat specific. Um, they love warm, humid areas. And generally these are kind of forest fields, marshes your lakes, rivers, streams, wetlands. Um, they primarily prefer riparian corridors. Um, it's one of their most important habitats. Um, and as I explained before, the riparian corridor is the kind of interface between the land and the river. Um, and only 1% of all land occupies this area. So it's a very small um, portion of land that serves an incredibly huge function. So not only is it firefly habitat, but it also is functions to slow down um, uh, floods and uh, high water events. Um, and so it can be very beneficial. So if that's not there, um, you know, it speeds up floods and the damage it does to the environment and then fireflies as well. So it all kind of works together. I just realized that um, I mentioned beforehand that there was like 1% of prairies left in Texas um, and then I was like, well, what if, I was just thinking, I was like, what if you're a riparian corridor in uh, a prairie, you would be the 1% of the 1%. So what does uh, firefly habitat look like in Texas? So I'm just gonna show some photos. This is kind of kind of a nice virtual tour through Texas, just to some places I've been, um, just so you get an idea. Um, from kind of different corners of just three different habitats. And this is just good so that you can train your eye on like what good firefly habitat looks like. 
So this is far west Texas um, in Jeff Davis County um, at a place called Fox Canyon Ranch, uh, a very large ranch out there. I got an opportunity to visit and uh, it's uh, really, you know, it's got very uh, niche uh, habitat uh, because of where it's located, but it does have really good firefly habitat. And so you can see here in this example, um, we've got kind of diverse canopy heights. Um, we've got uh, water in this uh, creek here. Um, over that tree over off to the right is actually a maple tree. Um, and so it needs some good moisture. Um, and then we've got, you know, some forbs that are growing up here. Um, and some just different kind of bunch uh, plants, native plants. Um, so relatively, you know, good, good habitat. Absolutely beautiful place too. Um, this uh, image is of Honey Creek in Guadalupe River State Park in Comal County. Um, you can see this, this uh, kind of habitat looks a little bit different than the last one that I showed you. Uh, we can see the cypress trees that are growing up here. Um, you can see that this probably creates a much darker habitat at night uh, because of how tall the trees are. And you can also see a wide variety of plant types that are occurring kind of in this riparian corridor area. Um, you can see some small trees that have come up after like a flood event, for example. Um, and then you've got different types of grasses here. And then obviously, uh, you know, this, the spring system providing water. Um, so just a neat habitat. At night, this looks like super pitch black dark. I mean, you cannot see your hand in front of your face. And uh, fireflies really enjoy this. And they typically will flash kind of on either side of this um, or sometimes behind those two trees in the foreground. I'll see a lot of flashing going on. So this is a, um, an interesting property um, in Travis County, actually, in Bee Cave. Um, the landowners that have this property had spent many years restoring it back to kind of its original state. And beforehand, they used to have this um, ephemeral, uh, ephemeral kind of stream here. And they went about restoring grass species to their land. Um, and you've got this really rich um, diversity of, of plants here going on now. But it's kind of like a prairie in a way. And um, what it does is it holds a lot of moisture in the ground. And so the landowners used to tell me that when they first moved in, uh, they used to have water in the creek all the time and um, just really constant. And then as they improved the habitat and spent a lot of work doing that, uh, basically the, you know, uh, the water started to go away, but it, they basically kept it on their land. So they actually gained some actually as a pro to it disappearing. But what this helped create was really, really excellent firefly habitat. I mean, really robust, so much so that like, sometimes you can measure the health of a, a firefly habitat by as amount of, by the uh, amount of sugar bites that you get. So on this particular property, I got 100 sugar bites so, uh, at one night. And let me tell you, that's, that wasn't pleasant at all. Um, and so very healthy environment. So um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop here and then open it up to questions. And let's see here. Well, we have. One from Tracy, or we have the first one we have is from uh, Rufus T. Firefly, and they ask, "Who can help me assess my soil health?" Um, the county agent can do that. Um, if you have a local area or a master naturalist chapter, for example, um, that can definitely help out. Um, I would definitely tap some local experts and, uh, like local gardeners, for example to assess your soil health. Um, I would definitely call uh, some of the local, local chapters um, to definitely do that, to come out and take a look at it. Um, I'm sure you'd get some volunteers. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, what type of dark sky policy should we advocate for specifically asks Trace? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, Trace, um, uh, what I would recommend would be downward facing lights. So these are lights that basically point downwards and they don't point upwards in all directions. And uh, you wanna avoid lights that, that cast glare essentially. Um, and so you don't want lights just wasted basically in all directions. So you want downward facing lights and then you want amber colored lights. Lights that are soft on your eyes are gonna be lights that are gonna be soft on fireflies eyes. So that is uh, real important in order to do that. Um, if you uh, go to your city councilman, just ask what they might know about 
light pollution, for example. Um, and just kind of feel it out is a good way to approach that. Um, and just say that you're concerned, you know, uh, for, you know, fireflies and a variety of other species. Uh, dragonflies, for example, are affected by light pollution. Um, they'll see um, basically oil slicks in the, in the road and confuse that with actually water. And so they'll lay their eggs with, on asphalt and then obviously, you know, doesn't provide for next generation. Okay, next question. Um, Tracy asks again, can you trigger uh, firefly responses by flashing your own lights? You can actually. Um, and the way to do this, if you want, um, is to get a small pin light um, and basically uh, go out and what you're trying to simulate is a female, uh, essentially. So, you know, you can you can do this by uh, flashing once every few seconds um, and or once a second and, and a, a male might come and see you and confuse you for that. Um, if you use like a flashlight, for example, um, and you go out in the dark and you just flash it at a bunch of fireflies, that's probably not going to get you anywhere. Uh, so you want to be a little careful and you want to get a smaller light to do it. Um, and I've had good success with it. Um, there's a couple different sequences that uh, firefly researchers use um, to mimic the flash pattern of a female um, that can be helpful. Uh, but yeah, I would just go out and, and test. You want to study your own environment and see what's, what kind of flash is going out. And so you can try to mimic that. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark and Debbie Carter ask, when do you make a population count and how? Um, good, good question. So um, if I'm going to do a population count for an environment, um, there's two strategies you can employ. Um, one is kind of like mid spring in your habitat, um, you know, right when things are getting going. Um, and generally, you want to count males and females. Um, counting females can be kind of difficult. Um, and so you want to basically set some parameters up of like, so for the next minute, I'm going to count, you know, how many unique flashes that I can, you know, see and then keep a log of that. And that's a good way to do it because um, you need a consistent data to kind of give a, a count. You can also just go out and just see what's out there. Um, the other strategy is to do it at the end of the season, um, kind of when firefly males are coming a little bit desperate. Um, and the reason you do this is because there's just a, like kind of less of them and you can get a, a better idea of the flash patterns that are going on um, and you know possibly get an idea having seen what was already out there. But if you wanted to do a, a population count, I would set up some dates and say every day on this day, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna record how many flashes um, or individuals that I see within this minute, five minute period. And then that would be a good way in order to assess uh, population health over a period of time. Mm -hmm. um, Mark and Debbie Carter ask also, uh, and I think you kind of already answered this, but they ask, can herbicides affect fireflies? And you, I know that you talked about uh, beetle herbicides specifically. Is there, is there a more broad herbicides that also kind of are detrimental to them? Yeah, I would say that there are some herbicides that can be detrimental to fireflies. Some of the research is still kind of out on it in terms of like its long-term effects. But if you look at herbicides that ranchers use, for example, um, for example, like Remedy is one of them. There's also, you know, brand names like Sendero and, um, you know, Reclaim and stuff like that. Some of these uh, particular uh, herbicides can last in the soil for like 30 years. Um, and then also uh, get into water systems. So you got to be really careful on that. And, um, you know, so there's kind of like a, a secondary effect that affects plants that then affect fireflies. Um, I'm sure that the chemicals that make up these herbicides obviously probably aren't great for any living thing if you, you know, came in close contact. Um, but, you know, some of these, you know, chemicals are useful for invasive species control. So they do have to be used. Um, so generally with the pesticides, those are ones that are long acting, you know, that stick around that are really toxic. Um, like for example, mosquito control, that in insecticide is rather weak, whereas opposed to something a lot stronger, um, like pyrethrum, for example, 
lot, you know, going to kill things really quickly. So great question. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris asks, uh, there's an area in the country where the fireflies show up at a certain time of year and their blinking is synchronized, uh, but you can't remember where. Oh, yes. Okay, so that is um, in Tennessee and the Smoky Mountains. Um, it, they're the synchronous fireflies that occur there. Uh, the species name is uh, Photinus carolinus, um, and it occurs for kind of a, I think a three to four week window. Um, it actually occurs all the way from Tennessee down to Georgia. So there's a lot of different places this species does occur, but it's a super popular place. Um, I know the, 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 the lady that discovered this species um, and uh, when I asked her if uh, I could come visit her uh, to come see the synchronous firefly, she was like, no way. And I was like, why? She's like, oh, cause it's a big mess. And there's, you know, uh, if you want to go look at synchronous fireflies, I'll tell you where to go, but you don't want to go to the Smokies. Um, so, uh, that's, that's a great question. It's a wonderful thing. And, but you can see them kind of in a lot of different areas. Uh, Parker asks, when is the end of the season? Uh, they still see some in the prairie. So Texas is really fortunate because we actually have like, you can almost see fireflies here for almost 10 months out of the year. If you know where to look, I've seen fireflies actually in December, uh, January, February are really the only months where it really lacking of any fireflies whatsoever. Um, and so uh, there's really not an end season. Maybe the end season occurs when temperatures kind of drop below like 65 or so. Um, that's when things really get, you know, tamped down. Um, and so or there's a long period of cold, for example, or a drought that comes up. So we're going to see fireflies here in Texas until probably October time frame, maybe into November. Um, last year, for example, was a pretty good year um, that, you know, lasted for some time, but each area is different. Uh, Mark and Debbie Carter, they ask, I think they're asking specifically, like, I got, I'm a little bit perplexed, but they're, they're at, they're, they say glyphosate and uh, imazep, or, or it's a glyphosate and imazepic, question mark, kind of like, uh, herbicides? Oh, um, you know, I don't know of any effects that, that fireflies have with uh, glycosate. Um, and basically, uh, I would say it'd be pretty minimal. Um, the only time when it would be probably a big effect is if you were spraying this really consistently um, mm -hmm. in agricultural settings. But in normal settings where it's used properly and it's described, it's probably very minimal. Mm -hmm. if, if any effect and i'm not yeah i think we're uh, ready to go back to the presentation now okay great thank you all for the questions those were some really good ones um really really good ones um okay so this next part of the presentation i'm just going to talk about species um, i'm going to go through some of these kind of quickly um you know, because it can get kind of bogged down in terms of like species here. So what I did do for, for your group was I added a unique species that we'll talk about briefly that was just named last year in Mississippi that might occur in uh, the Nature Center area. Um, so something to keep a lookout for is kind of cool. Um, and then um, I, I kind of focus more species that you'd see in kind of East Texas kind of area, kind of the Piney Woods area um, in that kind of swampy area. So don't feel the need to write all this down. Um, what I've just shown here is just the species names because that's helpful sometimes to, to understanding what's here. Um, but we've got about 45 species here in Texas. Um, Photinus species, or Photinus genus of fireflies is going to be the most in con uh, encountered genera in Texas. So this is the firefly that you're going to see most often. Uh, there's about 15, 20 species here um, and they, you know, range from a few diurnal uh, to many nighttime flying species. And this includes the common Big Dipper firefly, uh, Photinus pyralis. This is one that you'd see in urban areas and suburban areas, um, any, anywhere. It occurs all the way up uh, the Atlantic, uh, up to the Northeast, um, and down here to Texas. It's very widespread. Um, they're about five to 15 millimeters uh, long, and they're most numerous in the early evening. 
And they're also one of the only genera that's present in both spring and in fall as well. So um, if, you, if you know that and you go out this fall to look at fireflies, um, Photinus is going to be one that's going to occur as well as Photurus. So this is just a kind of a some brief information on Photinus pyralis, the common firefly. Um, this is the most commonly seen species in Texas. Uh, it's a rather large firefly, nine to 15 millimeters. Um, it's got a black wing cover with a kind of a yellow border here. Um, in Texas, we've got two variations. We've got one that has a black spot and then one that lacks the black spot. In some cases, you'll find populations where you hardly ever see the black spot whatsoever. Um, and this is just an example of what's called um, phenotypic variation. Whereas that in the species, there's variation that occurs. And so the species that occurs here in Texas of Otinus pyralis is kind of our unique for Texas. Um, when they did genetic work on this species here, they basically found that um, it was almost on its way, halfway to becoming like its own species basically here in Texas. So the pyralis that we have here in Texas is at least somewhat genetically unique than the ones that occur way up north, but they're still considered the same species. They have a distinctive J-type flash pattern and they flash every four to six seconds. Otinus concesis. Um, this was one that was named in the 70s. Uh, it's an endemic species here in Texas. It occurs kind of in a, a, a narrow range in the hill country from Val Verde County all the way over to kind of Comal County and to Travis County. Um, it is, uh, looks very similar to Pyralis. Um, and uh, the exception is that uh, females respond a lot quicker. So about 0.6 seconds as opposed to two seconds. Um, and they also fast uh, flash faster um, every two to 2.7 seconds. So this uh, video that I'm gonna show you is uh, going to basically show you Photinus concesis flashing. All right, so what you just saw was um, uh, Photinus concesis fireflies flashing. This was in Val Verde County, actually, um, on the Devil's River. And what you might have noticed and what this video is kind of trying to show was the, the, the flashing that they did of the species I just talked about, but also kind of the semi-synchrony that occurs um, within kind of large groups of fireflies. Um, and so just kind of a neat, neat thing to look at. So this is what a male Photinus concesis looks like um, from that video I just showed you. So this is actual uh, firefly from that location, then photographed and shown here. Um, and it's really kind of cool to see. Uh, you can see this, this uh, individual has um, all black wing covers, uh, whereas the species specific or where the species in general also has a yellow border here. So it's just a unique kind of variant. Um, and so it has two light organs here um, and no black spot. This is what a female looks like. You can see um, she looks very similar to the male, um, but obviously has uh, one light organ here. So this is a, a really cool video um, and I'm gonna play this. And what I want you to, to watch is uh, the, the courtship flash sequence between the two. There's going to be a male in this video and there's going to be a female. And uh, this was an experiment that I set up um, and I'll tell you a little bit about it after we watch it briefly.
All right, so this goes on for a while. Um, what y'all were, were witnessing was a male and a female flashing at each other. And uh, what we were looking for here was just the, the female delay time uh, between the two. What I didn't tell you about this was that um, this was an experiment to watch that delay time, but what I did was I put coffee filter paper in between the two so that they couldn't see each other uh, or not see each other, but they couldn't get to each other. So it was a little bit of a trick, but if they would have made it, they would have stopped flashing and it would have been over. So this goes on for a few minutes, of course. Um, but this was also interesting in that I took a male firefly um, from uh, Comal County and I mated it with a female firefly um, over 200 miles from 200 miles away. So what this was trying to prove was to see if they were the same species or not. Um, to see if they can mate. Now, I never did allow them to get to uh, lay eggs, but it was an interesting uh, experiment nonetheless from uh, putting two fireflies together from across the state uh, together and see what would happen. And uh, sure enough, they were able to mate, but that was it. So this was a cool experiment. So this is uh, just a brief on Stellaris. Um, this is gonna be essential to West Texas species. I don't think, know if this one will be found kind of in the, the Eastern part of, of Texas. I, I, I highly doubt it. Um, it's a very small species and, and um, I'm only gonna to touch on it briefly, but it's a, a fast flasher every once a second. So just something to keep in mind if you're trying to, to, to ID species by flash pattern, um, look for how they flash. I actually saw one of these a couple days ago um, flashing really fast and they have kind of a, you know, a quick arching. They like to fly over the tops of bushes. Um, this is what a female firefly looks like of this uh, species. Um, and this is why I kept in this presentation because this is a, a really, really cool, cool thing. Um, this particular female had been photographed in about 100 years. So nobody had really ever seen what it looked like. It had only been described in literature. Um, but you can see that it doesn't have any wing covers. Um, and or has very reduced wing covers um, and she can't fly. And so basically she's heavily invested in terms of laying eggs and she just crawls along the ground and doesn't go very far. Um, and so when people talk about conservation of uh, firefly habitat, these are one of, uh, of the types of fireflies that need the most protection because if they're the size of the grain of rice um, and they get trampled or taken out, um, you know, they're gone for good. And these are ones that are most vulnerable since they can't fly. Just a like, couple interesting facts um, you know, of this. It's been 100 years since it's seen in the wild. And not that they weren't there, just nobody had photographed one in that time until um, I discovered this and got it photographed. Um, and she, she kind of chooses the largest and most vivid males um, in, in the example that I saw. Um, I was able to witness them mate. Um, and it's, since they're so small, like, as a grain of rice it takes a male a long time to find the females on the ground. Um, just a brief size comparison between firefly types of species. So off to the left was a firefly that you watched that flashing video of. Um, and then off to the right is uh, Photina stellaris, the smaller firefly. It's very hard to get two fireflies right next to each other in photograph. So very, very hard. Um, but it, it, it shows the difference between the sizes that you'll see in, in the wild. Um, I left this species in here because it could occur in your area. Um, Photinus texanus is uh, rather, rather well distributed um, in Texas. So one to look out, it's a very small one, very scrappy firefly, very hard to catch because they fly really fast. Um, and they've got, you know, quick blinking uh, kind of flash pattern every two seconds or so. This is an example of a flash pattern of uh, uh, firefly, uh, Texanus showing basically kind of it flashing up the side of a hill. Um, and some species actually prefer, males start off will sometimes low and then they'll progress over overnight. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this is Photinus uh, dismissus, um, accidentally left this one in, but it's a, it's a neat image nonetheless showing uh, the flash train. So uh, just a question, um, you can go ahead and comment in the chat if you'd like, but this is just for fun. So what likes to eat fireflies? And so a lot of times people ask me, you know, so what actually does eat a firefly? Um, and a lot of times they'll ask me if it's bats. So bats is not the answer, but I'm gonna give you a hint. 
And I'm going to give you a couple minutes, like a couple seconds to think about it. And then I'll, I'll let you know the answer. Um, but feel free to put some answers in the chat function and we'll review those kind of at the end. But what likes to eat a firefly? What, what would eat one? So here's your hint. So study this image carefully because um, it's a very rare uh, captured image. Um, and I'll give you some hints. There was something trapped in something and a firefly saw it and came in to investigate. And when it investigated it, it had an accident. So just study it briefly. You can see the firefly kind of came in and uh, circled in here, uh, did this kind of flash pattern and then kind of circled around something and then something happened. Um, this is a good question. It's a good, good image for, for the fall, it seems like. Okay, so you're like, Ben, what's the answer? Uh, what, what happened here? What's the crime scene data? So it was a spider, it usually is. Um, spider ate a firefly. Um, what happened was a firefly uh, landed in a spider's web and this spider came in and basically cocooned it and it started it starts doing this SOS kind of blinking thing and you can see that here um, in this little bright spot right here. So that's actually the firefly in the web and what happened was um, I believe a Futurist firefly came in um, thinking it was either a female or something to eat and circled in and then landed on the web and then dropped straight down and that's this line right here. So a really rare example of like something you see in the wild um, and then we're able to capture on a photo. Um, so kind of a, a really cool thing. So spiders eat fireflies a lot and they're usually seen very commonly in, in the field. So Futurist fireflies, I just mentioned, was the one that potentially landed on that web there. Um, and I'm, I, I'm only gonna, I'm gonna touch on these briefly. Um, and so there's, these are really large fireflies. Um, these typically um, occur um, in late May to late June. Um, you can occasionally see these in the fall if it's a good year. There's a couple complexes. We won't go into that in detail. They're very hard to ID based on flash pattern. Um, and you can only do that with a male flash pattern. And then some species are known as femme fatale fireflies is that they eat the fireflies of their uh, other species to acquire kind of defensive steroid-like compounds that make them poisonous uh, to predators, birds, bats, spiders, that kind of thing. So uh, I put this in at the last moment while y'all were doing your meeting. Um, and so it was like, uh, I remember the species that got described, described last year and I said, all right, well, let's, after they've watched this presentation and I've talked and talked, uh, let's see if they can guess one of the most complicated firefly flash patterns in the United States, because um, it's rather interesting. And this particular species um, called Futurus waldoxii was described in 2019 um, by a lady named Lynn uh, Faust and uh, it, is described in a habitat that um, may not be exactly like what you have in uh, the nature center area and the prairie kind of area, but it is still a marshy area. And then there's probably habitats that are similar in your region um, that I know of that might be like this. So something to keep an eye out for, and that's why I put it in here. Um, these are pictures of swamps in uh, Mississippi, um, but we've also got swamps here in Texas. And this particular species is found in Mississippi and Indiana, um, and then maybe in Texas as well, um, up in north, north, east Texas, up in the corner there, there's a species like this, very similar to this, but it doesn't have uh, as quite complicated as a glow. So um, what I'm gonna show you next is what the flash pattern looks like. So something just to keep an eye out. And what this is, is a flash train plus a glow, okay? And so this is a species specific thing. And so what males um, are flashing to females. And this is what it looks like. Um, so you see here, um, there is a complicated flash patterns going on and you're like, there's a whole bunch of squiggles. What's, what's, what's this all about? But it's kind of broken down here. And you can see that it's five dots, a glow, and then another two dots, and then a glow. 
So that's a lot going on. Um, so that's a really complicated flash pattern um, and for a firefly, for tourists specifically. Um, so just something to keep an eye out if you see some kind of you know quirky firefly flashing going on. Um, this species you might want to, to watch out for. Um, it occurs in uh, Waldoxie State Park in Mississippi, but it's definitely conceivable it's here too. Um, I'm only one more species of Futurus, and then we'll just go over a few a Pyractomena in your area, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, this is Futurus catrinae. Um, it was described a couple years ago, um, and this is kind of one of the big scary fireflies. This is the very erratic flasher. Um, it's one of the ones that eats um, other types of fireflies. And you can only ID it based on the male flash. This is an example of uh, what Cat Renee's flash pattern kind of looks like. It's kind of once a second um, for females, just kind of erratic uh, flying around. We really can't say exactly whether it's a male or female, but it's likely a females that were cruising along looking for other fireflies to eat. Um, but just a kind of a beautiful image of, of kind of what some of the flashing would look like over an extended period of time. Oh, uh, and then Bill Browneye, uh, Futurus Bill Browneye kept this in here because it could occur in your area. Um, this is in the complex of species that occurs into um, North Carolina and a few other places in the South. So it's possibly in your area. Um, I would bet that there's something similar there. Um, Futurus uh, frontalis, for example. Uh, this is a medium firefly. It's kind of the gentler type. Um, it's got a double flicker flash every one to 1.1 seconds. Really beautiful firefly to watch because it flickers twice. Um, it almost looks like the flash kind of merges together and it flashes relatively pretty fast. So lastly, um, Pyrectomena. And these are the ones that are gonna pertain to your particular area of Texas because um, they're most often found in kind of water swampy habitats. Um, and they're abundant in the coastal Eastern regions of Texas. And they're known for their amber colored flash patterns. Um, and these fireflies generally um, are ones that you will only see in like single uh, encounters or in small groups. Um, you won't find them in huge groups. Um, and some people are probably like nodding their head because they've seen these. Um, they're like, and they're thinking, in, and they usually see just a single one. So, Pyrectomina punctiventrist, um, a rather complicated uh, name. <laughs> uh, is a endemic species, but it could occur in Mexico as well. Um, it's fairly abundant in the coastal regions um, in Texas, especially in the Rio Grande Valley um, and kind of all over in different spots. Um, this is a species that uh, you can keep an eye out for. It's got a strong yellowish amber flash. Um, it's a brief amber flicker every four seconds or so. And uh, this, it's a rather uh, a large, you know, flash. Um, and it's, this is also in a complex, too, of, of different types of species. And this one is uh, Pyrectomina borealis. There's been a lot of research on this firefly. It's the earliest to come out in uh, the spring, um, as early as um, like April, maybe even the end of March, for example. Um, and it's seen early in the evening. It's a high treetop flasher, so it flashes really high. It's one that you might see in your area. Um, primarily eastern coastal counties in Texas. Um, there's actually not a lot of specimens in um, collections of this, so I'd be interested in getting more to document which counties it in, is in. Uh, but it flashes every two to three seconds and it's another amber flasher. And lastly, these are just some of the other species here in Texas. Um, I, could, I could talk about others, but just some kind of fun ones. Um, these are a firefly off to your left that as a kind of a feathery antenna and um, there it has a it looks a lot different it does glow as a juvenile and at, at once it comes out as an adult but generally they're non-luminous and then um, off to the right is a species called aspisoma um, that it's only been seen about four times since 1935 so pretty rare um, in 2019, um, early 2019 there in July, there was a researcher in South Texas um, in the Rio Grande Valley near the coast who was at a research station studying, I think, birds. And she saw this firefly in the bathroom um, and was like, well, that's a kind of a neat looking beetle. And it really is a kind of neat thing. 
So she took a photo and uploaded it to um, iNaturalist and um, we all were quite in, in shocked and impressed. So pretty neat deal. Um, these are a firefly that occurs in Mexico, this genus. Uh, so, you know, the value of iNaturalist here can be beneficial. So that's it, thanks for attending. Um, we'll just uh, kind of, uh, these are some contact information if you wanna contact me. Um, sometimes I do get busy with emails, so please be patient with me as if you email me um, and you have a question or something, but uh, that's my uh, phone number. Um, so thank you all for attending tonight. I really do appreciate it. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the share and turn it back over. All right, uh, Chuck, are you there? Sure am. Um, I think Patty's gonna host a little uh, 